Welcome back to Just Blazer Programming. Today, I have some exciting news on an exciting new video for Blazer United. Have you heard of it? If you have not, then stick with me because I'm going to demystify what is Blazer United and why it's so important for everyone in the Blazer community to understand and to look forward to because this could be the game changer, the cure for the biggest problems that Blazer has so far when it comes to development and overall, you know, optimization. So, we're going to get into that in this video right now. So before we dig into Blazor United specifically, I want to get into why Blazor United came about in the first place. So uh, this is just for the uninitiated. You may skip to the Blazor United part if you want to. But in case you want to know what the issue is and what Blazor United is meant to solve, I have the two hosting models for Blazor here, the two main ones at least, uh, Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly. So in Blazor Server, the way it works is that your your basically all the components and stuff are rendered in the server. And that is fed to the DOM uh, through SignalR. And that is how your user interacts with it through those SignalR connections. That is how you're able to go back and forth between the server and the client, give them information and whatever. Be and because of that, there is no real need for you to actually have the entire project loaded up. It doesn't work like other spa or spa frameworks or spa related frameworks where you have everything loaded up in the beginning. This will just load up as you go along. However, you do need an active internet connection and SignalR needs to be connected in order for you to actually maintain this application and continue the, uh, the, the user, you know, back and forth. If this connection is ever lost or if you run out of connections, then your application suffers for it. So that can happen because there is a finite amount of connections you can have through SignalR between the apps. And yes, you will need to have the internet on all the time in exchange for that the way that it loads content is much faster than let's say for blaze web assembly which is one of the major problems with blaze web assembly so for blaze web assembly for the for those of you uninitiated how it works is just like any other of the uh front end frameworks out there that are popular like angular or react where it loads up all the content in the browser first in this case it has to run c sharp basically so it has dot net razor components all that stuff that is all rendered in the browser through web assembly and then that does, and then after it all renders and everything, then you have basic access to all the .NET stuff that you would normally have access to uh, in the server, more or less. And then that will do, and then you can do API calls and such, just like you would have to do with any other spa framework or whatever, uh, like Angular or React. So that's why WebAssembly is pretty popular. And also there are implications for it with through containerization and serverless uh, and it lends itself very well to cloud uh, integrate uh, to being hosted in the cloud and being used in the cloud. So, uh, um, so that's why Blazor WebAssembly is actually the more popular of the two. And the from what I've seen, at least from what I've seen from you guys out there who have watched me, a lot of you want WebAssembly stuff, and it's understandable. Like I get why, and also you don't have the problem with having SignalR connections. Uh, you won't need that, essentially, for this case. However, you do suffer initially so you pay in the beginning to have a smoother experience uh you know for the rest of time in theory however you know that's pretty slow uh slowness affects seo slowness affects websites performance blah 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 you know having a slow website that loads especially if you have a complex web application or some sort um that can be a problem especially if you're hosted in servers that are far away from far away from your users or whatever, then they're going to have a really bad user experience. And then that's a good way of getting people off your site if you're hosting a site or just having a bad user experience to whatever clients you might have, et cetera, et cetera. It's not really good to have a slow website. It's just basically what it is. So, and that's what Blazor United is meant to solve. It's meant to grab the best of both worlds and unite them, you know, hence the name, right? So let's get into that. So in case you don't know, Blazor United, the information for that comes from this video and from like articles and stuff um, that have been written about it for .NET 8. And this is supposedly going to be in the .NET 8 preview whenever it comes out. Um, but for now, if you want to get try it, basically, you can go to the ASP.NET Core branch and go to the Blazor United branches and then try using it um, you know, on your own local computer or whatever um, in your own local environment. But most of the information actually comes from this video here and then whatever articles that were written from it. But I'm just going to cover the actual important bits, at least of what I find to be the most important bits for Blazor United that um, I think is the most relevant. So we're just going to skip to 
430. And by the way, let's give credit to Steven Anderson. He's the one that uh, basically made this, I believe. And uh, yeah, you should watch this video. I have the video in the description below in case you want the full context. I will be hopping around and might not be giving this guy, you know, a chance to talk. So because I also don't want to just, you know, show a whole video like that. So in this case, there are a few bits for Blazor United that are really important, in my opinion. And the first one is actually the stream rendering. So the stream rendering is essentially, well, let's let This loading state can now be streamed to the browser as part of that initial page response. So I'm going to recompile my app and we'll see what difference we load. You can see we see this loading recipes message appearing while we're waiting for the database call to come back. Same if I do a search, uh, that's also. Anyways, in case you didn't get that, what's happening here is that he's activated something called stream rendering and that allows him to basically have this page loaded and so that your user actually does see stuff on the page. And then the things that are not loaded yet, you'll just um, have a state that says oh, what's not loaded will have um, you know something on the HTML that says something and then it will load in everything. So it's a little bit better than having either the whole page being blank or you know having a big loading circle on top of everything. This makes it look a lot better. Now he does go, I believe he does go commit a little bit of blasphemy. You know, I think he does. He's a little bit of a blasphemer uh, in the sense that when he goes into the next step and the next thing that I also find to be very important uh, to be added is this step right here. User experience in various ways. So we're thinking of creating this little script that you can add in. Uh, not that one, this one. And once that's there, that's going to automatically enhance both navigations and form posts to make them faster and feel more like a spa, even though you're not actually using any spa technology. So in case you missed it, he has decided to go down a very dark path, I think. I think that uh, this will make Blaze United horrible and terrible. And um, and this guy is a blasphemer to the .NET, uh, .NET ecosystem, even though he works for Microsoft. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, by the way. What he's talking about here is that he's going to use JS in order to make this a smoother experience, AKA he is having, um, uh, he's intercepting the way this loads on the page essentially. So you could hear from his words, he does it at a full explanation, but essentially what's happening here that this JS makes, um, the intercepts the rendering so that you don't have to render the full page if that is needed. Um, and that's essentially what it is. It, it just makes the, the the pages a lot smoother and seemingly faster to your users. So it just is similar to how the stream rendering thing works, where um, essentially things look like they're faster. And in this case, what's happening is that he is selectively choosing what to render through JavaScript. However, obviously, that is just a very it's very nice to have. You know, I do have JavaScript stuff in my videos. But um, but yeah, that we're not at the most exciting part yet, which we're, we're all waiting for. And I think we all know that what it is. So the most exciting thing in this whole thing is going to be here. Yeah, we can see oh, here's our ingredients list editor. And I want to render this interactively. So I'm going to put this render mode. So right now, in case you can't read it here. He is selectively choosing the render mode of a component. So that means that he is choosing to have this be rendered via the server instead of render it through the client, let's say. And not only that, but you could also do this for the whole page if need be. And best of all, you could do this uh, both, you know, as a component or on a page. So you have a lot of control there. Not only that, but you also can, so this, He's using the same basically render mode uh, that he was using in the uh, in the little component, but for the for the whole page this time. Um, he's choosing WebAssembly for this. And in fact, we do. Now, if I compile that, that is going to run the same thing, but now it's dynamically going to start up the WebAssembly runtime when we go to that page. So there's no WebAssembly runtime in use yet, but when I move over onto Submit Recipe, it will have been started in the background. And so now everything will work the same as it did before. So essentially, we now have some up uh, something that's being served on the server, the home page, I believe. And now we have this, which is served through WebAssembly. So that's essentially what people have been asking for. They've been asking for a way to have the best of both worlds, Blazor server and Blazor WebAssembly. So Blazor server, you, that's what you show the people in the beginning, have WebAssembly loaded in the background, and then you have a nice app that doesn't require that many signal art connections. And then 
not only that, but later on he said he mentions that you can dynamically remove them depending on whether they're being used or not. That's also very good, which means that you will have, you know, uh, you won't have the issue of needing to continuously have these connections be on because you'll be switching off to WebAssembly, presumably. And there's one more bit here that I want to get into before, you know, we can talk a little bit more about it. The instant start right here. So what's happening here is that not only can you choose between server and WebAssembly, you can also have this choose to um, uh, choose your render mode between the two, depending on whatever is best, I guess. I'm not really sure how this works, but startup of Blazor server combined with the zero latency of Blazor WebAssembly. So what is actually doing here, I'm going to show you by uh, what we'll find is uh, that it's actually started up a Blazor server connection. So basically, this is what I said before. Uh, essentially, you have the, your Blazor server connection, but then there's the WebAssembly going in the background as well, and then that's the whole the whole trick. So you'd have the Blazor server going off, you hand it off to WebAssembly at some point, and then you have a nice fast web application that you don't have to compromise with JavaScript or whatever. Even though in the background JavaScript is being used, but you don't gotta touch it. Connection and assembly, which means that we don't need any connection to the server, so we can dynamically choose on a per page or per component basis between server and WebAssembly based on whether the user has already got the files cached. And so essentially, as long as you have web, uh, all your files loaded, you can just keep using WebAssembly and the user wouldn't even know that that's happening. So initially server, then you switch to WebAssembly. And so right now, this is just a prototype. You could always play with it through the GitHub that I showed you before. And the only thing I will say is that he said that the, you don't have to change your architecture to uh, to support all this. But um, I will say that there might be considerations for your architecture that if you want to be able to have both modes for like a component or whatever, there might be a case where you have to build out your APIs um, in order to do the final switch WebAssembly. So you might not have to do this for every component. But for the ones that you know that you want to be handled through WebAssembly, then that's when you have to have your APIs already ready to go. And the ones that can be switched between the server and the web API, then that is another consideration there. Um, I'm not really sure how this looks like since he's gave us this very simple example here. And I love the, and that's basically what we've been looking for. We've been looking for a solution to the problem that Blazor has, which is either having the limitations of server through the connection issue or the limitations of Blazor WebAssembly through the loading problem that it has the initial load problem. So having one, so having one solve the other problem is a fantastic way of going about it. And the fact that you could actually switch between the two render modes or have it dynamic, that's also pretty good too. And not only that, I believe the implication is that it, Blazor United is not essentially a different hosting model. This it is using both in the project that even if you have originally a Blazor server or a Blazor WebAssembly uh, project, let's say, you can continue using them without worrying them that they're going to like stop support or whatever at some point. And you could actually move between these, you know, these hosting models. So that that's why I really like about it is the flexibility it gives you. And if you ever want to upgrade to using this kind of model for your architecture at some point in time, then you can do so. And it doesn't seem to be super crazy. So. I'm excited for Blazor United. I can't wait to come out and I can't wait for this to, uh, they get more further down the line before yeah, I start making like maybe a project and showing it off on the, on the site. Cause it is still a prototype and they don't have any, you know, previews yet from what I can tell. So we're just going to wait for that. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you do, please give me a like and subscribe. Maybe check out this next video here. Maybe, maybe sort of. Also, I have a free Blazor cheat sheet for you. I worked out very hard on it and it's just basically condensing everything that Microsoft Docs would tell you that you might need for your next Blazor project. Anyways, that was the video. I hope that this illuminated something for you guys for Blazor United. And I hope you're just as excited as I am. Just Blazor programming out. Peace.